Welcome, everyone. Good evening. Welcome to this terrific event, terrific panel we have planned for you, and an urgent conversation, and I'll explain to you in a minute what that means. Sexism, misogyny, and patriarchy, where do we go from here? My name is Joy Connolly. I'm the provost of the Graduate Center, and I am honored to have you in our home as we think of this room. Uh, I want to say a little bit about the Graduate Center as an institution, and then a little bit about this event, and then I'll introduce our, our terrific panelists. The Graduate Center, as you might guess from our name, is a, is a national leader in graduate education. That is, education at the doctoral and masteral, uh, masteral, the doctoral and the master's level. So we offer the PhD and a variety of master's degrees. We're also the proud home of faculty with uh, a whole array of dazzling credits to their, to their names, the Nobel Prize, the Guggenheim Pulitzer Prizes. And we're, we want to foreground, especially given the issues of equity and justice uh, in front of us tonight, that we're one of the largest PhD granting institutions of the country in, in the country as a whole, and we're especially proud to rank among the country's top 10 institutions in awarding doctorates to students from minority groups. It's a great important part of our legacy. And the Graduate Center is also a place where people come together to think about the questions that motivate, that, that, um, that make challenging the times in which we live. It's had that reputation since its founding um, in the 60s, and we're proud of the fact that in venues like this, uh, in, that, that invite members of the public in, and also in the classrooms where our graduate students teach, uh, the, the students that we educate at the doctoral level teach in the CUNY colleges all over the city of New York and every borough. They teach each year, our doctoral students teach, an astonishing 180,000 undergraduates every year. It's just a really astonishing number. So it gives you a sense of the reach of this place uh, and the values that we seek to instill of vigorous academic debate, of high-level research, and of good conversation. So that brings me to the, uh, the, the kind of surtitle of tonight, Urgent Conversations. We believe at the Graduate Center that now is the perfect time to cultivate a series, an occasional series, happening each semester. It began last fall. It will continue next year. Um, tackling topics of, as I said at the beginning, urgent interest to our time and featuring uh, we anticipate a range of perspectives from the panelists, from the audience. We may not always agree. We may feel differently uh, about what facts count for what arguments. Um, we may have really radically different perspectives on these issues that face us. But one thing we're all committed to, and I hope I can invoke and speak for all of us in this room in saying this, is that we're committed to habits of civil debate, how to remember ourselves and how to revive in ourselves uh, maybe long forgotten habits or set aside habits, or maybe you cultivate them every day, which would be great. Habits of, of speaking from different points of view, not necessarily always agreeing, but listening hearing one another and talking through uh, those things that divide us in terms of points of view. Always keeping in mind that the aim here is to think, to have new thoughts, and to cultivate the habit of communication with others. So this is exactly what uh, very low standard I'm setting for our panelists right now, uh, but I know they're going to rise to the occasion and more, uh, and I'd like to introduce our panelists now. Carol Jenkins has agreed to serve as our moderator. I have to remind all my students and faculty to do the same thing whenever I stand up and <laughs> <laughs> clap. It's wonderful to have Carol's fans here. Carol needs no introduction. She's the host of the show Black America on CUNY TV. She's an Emmy Award winning journalist, uh, TV journalist. And during her reporting career, she anchored uh, WNBC TV's evening newscast and hosted her own daily talk show, The Carol Jenkins Live on WNYW. She's also the founding president and board member of the Women's Media Center, which aims to increase coverage and participation of women in media. So we're proud to have her here to moderate today's, tonight's panel. Susan Shira is our, fir is our first panelist here sitting on my left. 
Susan is a senior correspondent and editor for gender issues at the New York Times. She was appointed in to that post in 2016 after 20 years as an editor and senior executive at the Times. Previously, she served as deputy executive, ex executive editor overseeing all daily news operations, a project that you know, boggles my mind uh, in its complexity. She's also the author of A Mother's Place, Rewriting the Rules of Motherhood. And she was part of a team in 2009 that won the Pulitzer Prize that year for international reporting for coverage of America's military and political challenges in Afghanistan and Pakistan. Wendy Kameter is our next panelist. Wendy is a lawyer and social critic who writes about law, and liberty, feminism, and popular culture. Her latest book is entitled Worst Instincts, Cowardice, Conformity, and the ACLU. Her articles and reviews have appeared in the New York Times, in the Atlantic Monthly, the Wall Street Journal, and other publications. And you can also hear her commentaries that have aired on NPR. Next on our panel is Professor Bianca Williams. I'm especially proud to introduce Bianca because she's an associate professor of anthropology here at the Graduate Center. She studies topics related to race, gender, and activism, including black feminist leadership and the Black Lives Matter movement. She, her forthcoming book, uh, available on Amazon, I expect, is uh, The Pursuit of Happiness, Black Women, Diasporic Dreams, and the Politics of Emotional Transnationalism. Really fascinating work. She was previously Associate Professor at the University of Colorado Boulder, where she received the 2016 American Anthropological Association and the Oxford University Press Award for Excellence in Undergraduate Teaching of Anthropology. <laughs> And last but not least, our final panelist that I'll introduce tonight is Carol Robles Roman. She's, <laughs> she's the president and CEO of Legal Momentum, the Women's Legal Defense and Education Fund. She leads projects with big cities and organizations in gender justice, personal safety, and access to justice reform. Legal, uh, recently, Legal Momentum initiated high-profile legal actions on behalf of exploited women and girls in the areas of sex trafficking and, ex and sextortion, and these were featured in the documentary I Am Jane Doe. Carol was the Deputy Mayor for Legal Affairs and Counsel to New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg for 12 years. So please let me welcome you, give you, give you a hand, give our panelists a hand, and turn the evening over to Ben. Thank you so much, and uh, thank you all for being here tonight. This is uh, a, a great gathering. We have a huge crowd. I don't know, these topics of sexism and misogyny and patriarchy, you think, uh, you know, they th you think they still have some vibrancy? I guess so. Um, I am, uh, and thank you to my, uh, my co-panelists uh, here who are uh, just fantastic. They do have differing opinions about such things as Me Too, uh, and we'll get to that in a second. But um, I am just back from a weekend in Atlanta, uh, a conference called Power Rising. Uh, 900 black women, and really, the first time I've seen in a long time, almost all black women gathered for a conference to talk about Me Too, and about politics, and about life in general in the, these United States. So I want to start with Bianca here, who can uh, give us some insight into where you think we are in terms of, uh, of black women. And I recently had a conversation with Alyssa Milano, who is given credit for having started Me Too. And she, of course, gives credit to Tarana Burke, who did it long before, but because um, she is a black woman. She did not get the uh, the attention that uh, Melissa and Melissa is also a celebrity. So there you have that aspect of it too. Bianca, can you tell us, you know, where you think we are? Um, I think 
how we got here. Uh, when, I, when I'm watching um, the conversation and listening to the discourses uh, happening around Me Too, I think we got here from Black Lives Matter and a movement for black lives really starting a national, international conversation around not only law enforcement, which is what folks are known for, um, but a conversation around patriarchy and sexual violence. Um, and from that, we had the Women's March, um, where uh, Tamika Mallory, who's a black woman, is at the center of that organizing, and the connecting of the Movement for Black Lives and Women's March together um, generated this energy around people not only telling their stories, but saying, we're not going to be ignored and erased anymore. Um, and then we get to Me Too, Time's Up. And I think what those movements did commutatively, um, they forced us to really pay attention to how power operates and then have an intersectional analysis and practice around how we're going to change things structurally. So it was like we've been telling our stories, you're not giving voice to us, we've been talking and you've been ignoring it and we're not going to allow you to ignore us anymore. So I think that's where we are. Okay, and I would agree. Uh, Susan, you cover this a lot for the New York Times. Um, where, where, how do you place the beginning and the continuation? Uh, are we in the midst of the beginning of this movement? Is it dying out? Where do you, what do you think? I don't see it dying out. I, uh, to me, this is a really fascinating year because I think the women's march, and you know, you're absolutely right, Bianca, I think a lot of America was blind to what had been building um, partly because of the issues and, and uh, racism and other issues that you, that you legitimately raise here. But I think that um, there were a series of, of shocks, if you will, building, so that there was a kind of mini Me Too, if you all recall, um, during the presidential election. So that when the Access Hollywood tapes came out, um, and then candidate Donald Trump um, was accused by a number of women subsequently of sexual harassment and then his remarks on tape, there was actually a flooding of social media with a lot of stories about uh, women's issues of abuse. And then the election happened and the Women's March was the, the, the sort of first concrete moment when there was a kind of mass mobilization. But I, I think it had been building and I think that then what you began to see in this year, 2018, I'm watching a number of things that I know you're all familiar with, but I'll just tick them off really closely. So you had a year last year where you had a lot of marches, social advocacy, you had a lot of attention to old fashioned sort of activist organizing. You had all these groups spring up that drew on a kind of template for involvement that was often very quiet on the local level that, um, you know, for those my age, sort of hearkened to consciousness raising movements in one way, small circles where women would get together <laughs> and talk about what spurred them to act. And I think, you know, you saw then the rallying of really women-led activism, particularly in um, the ways in which members of Congress were confronted during the recesses about health care, and that was a bipartisan exercise, actually, because there were Republican con members of Congress confronted by Republicans about health care as well as the more, uh, the, the more substantial activism on the left. But that all builds to 2018, in which you have 390 women who say they are running for seats in the House of Representatives alone. Um, you have um, 79 women who are running for governor. And the, what, another thing that's really interesting is that a lot of the traditional barriers for women to um, attain political office, at least you have enormous amount of fundraising by women and campaign donations by women. 2016 sent a record for that, and 2017 doubled that, as far as I'm told by the people who track this data. So you have an enormous amount of political mobilization, and the question will be, will a lot of these women actually win office? Will, what issues will they run on? What will resonate? Will that translate? A lot of times, you know, national furor doesn't necessarily represent, translate into concrete this, you know, this member of Congress versus that. So we're going to have to watch the political movement. We're going to have to watch the Me Too movement and 
the ramifications for that, and I'll wrap it up because we want to be quick and get to everyone, but I think we are just at the beginning of a question of, you know, who powerful men for the first time in my memory are actually getting pushed out of jobs. It continues, but there are concerns being raised, um, and there are a number of worries about how you discriminate between what level of harassment, you know, is there any um, kind of time frame? How do you re-enter society or employment? And most importantly to me, the issues raised by Me Too are really fundamentally about power and how we negotiate power. So how does that bleed into other parts of society? The way that women are talked over at meetings, you know, the, the way that um, dating takes place. There are just so many ramifications. And if real change happens, it has to happen on a number of levels. And that's what I'm waiting to see this year. Okay, thank you. Carol Robles Roman, um, you've experienced this and directed and worked against, uh, you know, the kinds of sexual harassment, uh, trafficking, sextortion. You may have even created that word, sextortion. Uh, let's talk a she little bit. She moderated the panel where we did just that. <laughs> right. So let's uh, talk to us a little bit about where you see. Well, you know, the issue of, of gender equality is not new. Uh, the organization that I run is the former now Legal Defense and Education Fund. It's the oldest civil rights organization in, in the country. And it's really based on the premise that women should have equal rights to men. And so a lot of the rights that we've talked about that we take for granted were litigated 50 years ago, 40 years ago, 30 years ago, et cetera. And I, I wish I could say that these problems as they were resolved in the courts, you know, we were able to ch sort of check them off one at a time. So from my perspective, uh, and I'm gonna give some credit for my, for my thinking on the book Equal Means Equal by, by Jessica Newworth. Um, and in the book, Jessica analyzed a lot of these major cases that Legal Momentum litigated and other great people litigated. And most of the victims were worse off, and some of them actually won their case. So I think over the years, there was this false conversation and feeling that started taking place that these federal courts were actually protecting our rights. And in fact, they were not, but that was the fiction. So, so none of this is new for those of us that have been doing and representing uh, many women, many victims. Um, I tell them, go into a family court, um, the most horrific scene, any, how many people here have ever been inside of a, of a, a New York City family court in, in particular, and then go take a walk two blocks away and go walk into a, a federal courthouse. Oh my God, so beautiful, so pristine. Now who are the most of the people that walk into a family court? It's women, it's children, it's 99.9%, .9%, you know, like ivory soap, women of color. Um, and we see no resources. And I use the courthouse as the example of the inequity that takes place. Who the heck has ever read an article about family court? The thousands and thousands of people that go through there every day. Nobody. So what we see now is the media is, is properly covering the story. We are seeing a, a galvanizing of, of power um, for those that attended the marches. I mean, it was grandma, grandpa, kids in kindergarten, college students. It was an awakening of an intergenerational movement that I don't think we have ever seen in this country, or at least not in my lifetime. And I'm not going to tell you how old I am, but, I, but I'm, I'm, She's older a baby. Than, I'm older than I look. So that to me, is where the power of this new movement, and that is what's gonna take us. And I saw um, an equal number of men, and that has to be a critical part. They are co-equal partners, um, people of goodwill. We all have to be involved in this together. But I think it was the media putting a spotlight, and, and I think the reason they put a spotlight is a lot of the bad actors were, were media players. I'm not gonna call them out, we all know who they are. We read the articles. Um, and I think that played a big role. Thank you, Carol. And now, Wendy, there's a, a quote from you uh, that says that the Me Too movement is the unthinking woman's anti-harassment crusade. So we always, I love to start with Wendy because she's never not, uh, unprovocative. So uh, talk to us a little bit about 
your, your thoughts on the Me Too movement. What troubles me, uh, and I think it troubles a number of people, about the Me Too movement, without discounting the problems of harassment and abuse and all the problems that we've talked about up here, is one, the insistence that we categorically believe accusers that will lead to just as much injustice as categorically disbelieving accusers. It seems to me glaringly obvious that we should approach individual allegations with an open mind. I mean, that just seems like very obvious common sense to me. I am, uh, I'm sure there are just as many people who would like to hiss at me for saying that, so you really don't need to applaud it. Thank you. It's a polite group, right? No, I, I think that there is um, a tendency, and I think it's, this is partly because it's a, in no small part a social media movement, to descend into a kind of vigilanteism, and that goes along with the tendency, you know, the insistence that we categorically believe accusers. There is um, a fair amount of intolerance of dissent. There is strength in numbers, but there's also conformity in numbers. Uh, these are not new criticisms. You've heard them all, and I think they're obvious criticisms. And I don't, I, I, and I don't mean to discount the movement bit by them, but I think that they should be noted. And uh, as Susan mentioned, I think that we we frequently, you know, you frequently hear people not distinguishing between harassment, abuse, assault, and it's it's really hard to know what they're actually talking about. Um, I'm bothered by the tendency to look for very subjective definitions of, say, harassment. How do we define harassment? Well, if we define it by the reactions of the offended accuser, then we have no standard at all. That's an entirely subjective standard. And that's no standard at all because different people will be offended differently by different remarks, different behaviors, an entirely subjective standard gives none of us any notice of when we might be in danger of violating rules and regulations about harassment. This is a very difficult area because it is hard to try to import some degree of objectivity into these definitions, into the law. Um, you know, there's uh, an old convention of trying to import a, a reasonable person standard, in this case, a reasonable woman standard. Um, you could try to talk about whether something is intended to be harassing or intended to be abusive, but, but that leads to problems too, because sometimes people can be so um, insensitive to what really does constitute uh, harassment that intent doesn't necessarily matter all that much. So it's a, it's a very difficult problem, but it's a problem that we need to address. So I so also think, let me just sure. couple no, more please do. please do. I think it's very important to try to distinguish between harassment in the workplace, in work-related situations, in academia, and whatever we might consider harassment on the street or in social situations. Because on the street and in social situations, we all have a right to engage in racist, sexist, homophobic, otherwise presumptively hateful speech. We have a basic right to do that, that we don't necessarily have in these more constrained and formal workplaces, uh, formal environments, workplaces and schools, where you can justify putting some limitations, say, on people's speech rights. But I, I worry that this movement may be taking us down the road to over-regulating behavior in social situations, in more private situations, and, and I worry about the impulse to try to regulate out of existence, or, you know, at least strongly regulate antisocial behavior in general. I think that's very dangerous. I think it comes at a very high cost of everybody's civil liberty. Sure. And, and, I, and I worry too about the tendency of this movement to want to turn the mores that are expressed in social protests, which I may agree with, I may disagree with some, to turn them into law. And, and I'm, I'm not suggesting for a moment that people shouldn't protest, that people shouldn't try to change the culture, that people shouldn't try to change mores. 
But the primary lesson that I took from my brief and naive participation in the anti-porn movement going back to the late 1970s was that, and I, I, I naively thought that it might, it, it might continue to be a kind of consciousness raising movement and that it might not try to impose legal restraints on whatever was considered pornography. And I learned pretty quickly that it's very difficult to talk about a problem, to talk about a serious social problem without leading people to think about legal solutions, without leading people to think about ways of prohibiting it. And, and I fear that we are going to see efforts to import the kinds of very intrusive, vague, expansive rules about private behavior that we see on campus into state and federal law. And I think that will be a very serious threat to civil liberty. Yeah, you've given us a lot to, um, to think about here. Um, I want you to give us some examples of who you, who comes to mind when you think it was unfair, uh, some of the accusations of, of um, the sexual harassment, sexual assault, rape. I mean, do you in your mind have people that you think were treated unfairly, men who were treated unfairly? I think Al Franken was treated unfairly. And there's no doubt in my mind that if Roy Moore hadn't been running for Senate in Alabama, and if Minnesota had a Republican governor, that Al Franken would still be in the Senate. And uh, Susan? And, and that's, you know, that's not to defend some of Al Franken's behavior. Um, but there was no process. Um, it, was, it was very, very badly handled. And I think that the voters in Minnesota should have had more of a voice in it. Remember that Al Franken would have been up for re-election this fall. Sure. Uh, Susan, what your thoughts on, on that? Well, I just have to say, as a journalist, I'm not going to actually offer an opinion about whether someone was treated fairly or unfairly. That's out of my ability. Sure. Um, I guess what I would say observing is that um, I do think that this whole question of what are a range of behaviors and how and what are the definitions and what level of proof is necessary, th those are really urgent and complicated questions that people are really divided on. And, you know, I think if you look at the Aziz Ansari case, for example, um, that brought up a really, I think it provoked a really interesting conversation. But the question was, was that something you would define as sexual harassment? Was it a bad date? If it was a bad date, quote unquote, then why is it, you know, then do we think about the fact that many, many women have this experience and what does that say about how dating or courtship or sex is negotiated right now? So I, and I think that this is what I find interesting about this moment because it's, it's kind of throwing to the general public in some ways issues that ended up being confined to campus and often I think kind of became so polarized. Uh, you know, there's something um, interesting to me about it being thrown to a more, a more general societal way to wrestle. So I'm watching, that's what I do. What you're, happens you're on campus doesn't stay on campus. Bianca, your thoughts on, on this? Wow. Um, so I think part, so I'm a cultural anthropologist, um, and I don't believe that this movement or the various movements that add up to this movement are really only about legislation and policy. This is about cultural transformation. Um, and I mean, patriarchy, sexism, misogyny are things that we all are invested and a part of. Um, and so if we keep power at the center of the conversation instead of like identities or whose fault it is, then I think it changes the conversation. The conversation is really about consent and power, regardless of how you define, you know, whether it's sexual harassment, sexual abuse, any form of sexual violence, it's really about consent um, and, and who is able to um, engage in a relationship, whether it's a person to a person or a person to an institution and really say, I do not consent to this thing that is happening, whatever that thing is, and then be heard and respected and listened to. 
Um, Tarana Burke, who you brought up before, um, created the Me Too hashtag in 2006, and she said that some of this conversation around sexual harassment in the workplace and all these things are valid conversations, but that's actually not what she created the hashtag for. She created it to be a conversation and affirmation for black and brown women who were survivors to, to speak to one another about their strategies for survival, um, to be able to speak their stories. And I think part of what is frustrating to me in this moment is when we are bending over backwards to protect um, individual men, that we assume somehow women are getting famous and rich off of coming out and accusing people of sexual harassment. I don't know one woman that has gotten rich and is living the high life off of accusing men of sexual assault, the kind of pervasive shame and guilt that a woman um, has to go through and a trans person and a gender non-conforming person, a person of color has to go through to speak their story, the, to balance that out with this idea that there are cisgender white men who are, who are just you know, being traumatized by this when they haven't engaged in at all any patriarchy, to me, is um, another play around power and who gets erased. And I, I'll just finish by saying, um, it's very similar to me, uh, the conversation around, um, oh my gosh, why am I forgetting his name now? Colin Kaepernick. Um, and this idea, this critique that people have around the movement for black lives and how black folks really um, are vocal and public about the trauma and violence that they have experienced generationally. And I guess what I would love to hear is like, how do women and how do folks, men or people of other genders, experience this type of trauma when it comes to sexual violence, sexual harassment, sexual abuse? What would be the appropriate way for them to go about um, really getting justice for the harm that has done to them? Because we have a system where people have been reporting this for generations. Bill Cosby has had people reporting what he has done to them for decades and nothing has happened. So what is the appropriate, polite, we will now listen to you and pay attention to you and now give you justice form? But this idea that we're masses of people just going about and accusing random folks of sexual harassment, sexual violence to me, is somewhat of a, um, it's a Jedi mind trick. That I don't that's, believe. I, I hope you're not referring to me because that's not what I'm no, saying. No, no, at no. All. It's not you. I'm saying there's a movement. There's a movement of people who are trolling folks who are talking about the strong long term violence that has happened to them. And I think we are equating the positionalities of people when we're talking about the situation. We're saying that folks, women, and um, folks who are uh, trans who have experienced profound amounts of trauma are not entering this conversation with the same amount of power and privilege as the folks who are being accused of it. And I think when we act as if that's happening, we're doing them a, a disservice. Carol, I, I think that Wendy is afraid that all of this is gonna lead to new law, legal stuff. I think some of the old laws are just fine. Um, let's, let's just say this, let's just take a minute and let's focus on the fact that most women who are sexually assaulted, victims of violence, subject to sexual harassment, do not report. Period, hard, stop. So yes, I think it may get some new laws, but before we get to that conversation, there are laws on the books right now. There are policies on the books right now. And most people that this happens to are terrified to report, they fear retaliation. The EEOC did a report, and I take their stats and I, and I flip them around. I think they said this was a 2016 uh, study that they did on sexual harassment. And, and according to their analysis, and again, these are, I can't explain sort of what, what they looked at. I can only tell you that they said that 94, 6% uh, of people who are subject to sexual harassment report. Now, let's assume that that number is off by 10%. That's a little tiny number. And I can tell you based on my personal experience, so Legal Momentum is a, is a national organization, we have a national helpline. The calls that we get from women, a lot of the college girls as well, we do a lot of Title IX work, uh, and three quarters of them will not make a formal complaint, right? We, we, we work with them, we vet them. They won't even tell their parents, right? talking on, on the Title IX piece. Um, we've worked with people who are in a work situation 
and, and we vet it, and we say, wow, this is something that, you know, we're happy to help you informally or formally, and most of the women that we speak to will not report formally. They think they're going to be ostracized. They, feel, they fear retaliation, right? So maybe I should write a report and I'll publish this. But for the folks sitting here, I want you to realize that most of them are not reporting. And for the few or the minuscule or the ones that are concerned that they're going to make this a get-rich-quick scheme, and I'm not going to say that they don't exist, I cannot speak to that. But most victims do not tell anybody. And so that, for me, is the most important part of the galvanizing that's taking place right now. And there have been important movements that have been formed from galvanizing, right? Anybody ever heard of Martin Luther King? Anybody ever heard of the Civil Rights Act of 1964? Right, I'm a civil rights lawyer. I hold that, that's, that I clutch that to my breast. But that was as a result of, of galvanizing and of a movement. So yes, it's very important that no pendulum swing this way or that way. But right now, we have to figure out how when people are victimized, when a woman is subject to violence, when a child is subject to violence. You mentioned the lawsuit that we brought for uh, girls 13, 14, 15 years old that are being sold online, right? They tell nobody. Think about that. So we need to get this movement to a place where you report, you tell somebody, if you don't want to report formally, you know, listen, no one's going to tell you what is the best thing for you. But the fact that this is going on at the rate that it is, is alarming. And when we look at, you know, you haven't cited Harvey Weinstein, you look at some of those cases, first of all, one of those cases, two of those cases of the Harvey Weinstein, those were actually rape. When you look at, for example, just, just to make the point, Reese Witherspoon, when she tells her story, that was rape, R-A-P-E, and she was 16 years old. Now, it wasn't in a court of law, she didn't report it, she didn't go to the cops, it's an allegation, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe Reese Witherspoon is not telling the truth, I believe her, okay? And I think most people in this room probably do also. Why didn't Reese Witherspoon, who at 16 was a person of, of means, right? But she was a child. So if Reese Witherspoon is not reporting, right? Do I think that the woman of color, that the girl of color who's being trafficked or raped or sexually assaulted is going to report? The answer is no. So that's what I have been committing um, our resources to, is figuring out how do we get people to know what your rights are now. And we actually launched a movement called Rights Now, very clever, <laughs> which is what are our rights today, right now? You know, there are going to be better ones and greater ones, but what are you entitled to right now? And we've launched it with the City of New York, with the Department of Education. Uh, we have peer counselors, and they're training young women today what their rights are today. So if and when, you know, they're bystanders or they, 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 if it happens to them or something looks like it's going to happen to them, they're more empowered and they're more educated. I know Wendy wants to respond to that, and uh, we'll give her a chance, but uh, you should also begin to write your questions down for us, because we'll be getting to that part of the program very soon. We're eager to hear uh, your comments and your questions. No, well, I actually have a question for you, Carol, which is that, um, and I... She's the moderator. <laughs> I know, but she said I could ask a question. She gave me permission. You know, I, I sympathize and basically agree with everything you're saying, and I share that perspective. I understand the difficulties of getting people to report, and there is already a lot of law in place, which is one reason why I don't think we need a lot of new law. My question is... And I, may, can, and I think I agree with you there. Can, can we get to the place where women and girls will feel empowered to report without... Um, perpetrating this, uh, this idea, this mandate, that accusers must be believed. And, uh, you know, the, the challenge, I think, for people... I, I don't know where that... I've, I've never seen that mandate. I could tell you that we have Well, done... it's out there. It's out there culturally. I mean, it, we hear as, it all as, the time. As someone who does title Well, we hear nine... it in the Me Too movement, certainly. We hear it very strongly. Well, that's, in, that's in, part in, of the celebrity in, piece of it, though, Well, right? it's not just the celebrity Maybe piece. Maybe in terms of, I, I think that's what you're we trying to say, it, in terms of the media We hear it very reporting. strongly on campus, but, it, it, but here's the other question that, that 
the challenge, I think, for getting women and girls to report, especially when they're in very difficult situations, is that when you go into the legal system, the person you're accusing, however credibly you're accusing, however much evidence you have, is going to have a lot of rights, is going to have a right to confront you, is you know, going to have the whole panoply of due process rights. And I understand completely why people who've been victimized, who believe they've been victimized, don't want to have to deal with that. And I understand the impulse to say they shouldn't have to deal with it, except that I think they do have to deal with it and they should have to deal with it or we don't have a system of justice. Susan and wants I think that's to, a problem. Yeah, Susan wants to can get I, in on this. I just want to pose a, I didn't get to answer something my question. I'm wrestling. <laughs> can, can I, because can, yeah. I want to direct this to you and I think it'll work for both of these. Because I've kind of wrestled with this question. I did some reporting on the Bill Cosby case and then I spent months working on a project with my colleague about sexual harassment of blue collar women at two Chicago factories run by Ford Motor Company. Um, these were primarily, although not exclusively, women of color. Um, these jobs at Ford were incredibly good jobs with great benefits. They had a lot to lose. Um, and almost all the women who reported had a terrible time. Retribution from um, coworkers, you know, being accused of being Did they uh, report criminally or civilly? They report civilly. This is civilly. I'm, I'm now talking not in the courts, but, but you know, the re and then there is a lawsuit that's ongoing, which has its own long Dickensian history. Um, but I think that what I found is that this whole question of standard of proof and what level of evidence and what needs to be proven in court, and then if you looked at Ford's HR dilemma, if there is no witness corroboration, which is the case in so many of these cases, you know, I found myself not certain where the most just place was for these issues to play out. And I'm just curious about your perspective about that. That's, that is really the $64,000 question. So I've done these investigations. One of my uh, positions in a prior life, I was Special Inspector General for Bias Matters for the New York State Court System. And, and I was appointed, it was the first time that position was created because there were rumblings and uh, complaints, quiet complaints, not formal complaints, from court employees um, involving judges. And so, oh my God, who's the heck is gonna you know, commit su political suicide and go in and make a formal complaint about a judge? Um, so I was appointed and I conducted some really sensitive investigations against, you know, high level court employees, judges, et cetera. And it was really tough. And the only thing I can tell you from my experience, and, and that's, this was over 20 years ago and the office has maintained its, its credibility and its independence, is the fact that an independent office was created, somebody not tied to the institution, somebody who was gonna call it um, the way they saw it, and, and anybody who has had that position is, is a person with that reputation. Guess what happened? Women started to report. Women started to come forward. And some of them were substantiated, some of them were not. Now, the, the uh, statistics, if you look at statistics of investigations, um, it's about 50-50. So many often when there is a civil investigation, I would say more often than not, they are not substantiated. But guess what? That means something happened. Um, and so when you, when you dig and you dig and you looked, there was something very uncomfortable happening in the workplace that oftentimes did not violate the law, did not cross that magical line. But that doesn't mean that that stuff was good to happen. And most organizations do not have policies in place that it catches it early. Um, it sounds like, I'm sorry to say, the Ford people probably could have done better. Um, when you have something with integrity and you investigate early on, and guess what? A lot of times you just hear rumblings in the workplace, right? You know when something's not quite right, so you have to wait till it's an official report and it's, it's, it's all typed beautifully. No, you know when there's something going on in the workplace and it is really an employer's obligation to take some action sooner rather Yanka, than- I wanna make sure that you get a, that you get a chance to uh, jump in this conversation. Well, I mean, I think part of what we're really asking is like, what is the structural solution to some of this? Um, and I think, um, again, 
for me, it's a cultural issue around, if we censor patriarchy, how do definitions of masculinity have to be changed? How do men have to change how they think about their manhood or their identities? And part of what's happening is, instead of, um, we're having a conversation about women that is very important, but lots of the men who have been accused and lots of the men who have been found out to do this are very powerful men. And so institutionally, at universities, um, at corporations, if, if, it, if the conversation becomes, you know, it seems like to be a powerful man and to have privilege, you're doing it on the necks and backs of women, that's a different conversation. That's a conversation that's like, this is not a rarity, this actually is the norm in many ways. It seems like, if, if it's an epidemic for women, I don't know many women who have not experienced some form of sexual violence or sexual assault um, or sexual harassment. If that is the case, then we need to really be asking, all right, who's running these corporations? Who's running these institutions? And part of the way that they got to those places was by engaging in this behavior. That, that's, that's a cultural basic epidem epidemic question about how do we teach um, our men, our boys, how do we teach folks who are engaging with men and boys about how to do masculinity differently. I think the fear is that if we really identify all the folks who are perpetuating this behavior, then we have that Savannah Hoda moment where we're like, oh my gosh, that's my husband, or that's my best friend, or that's my son, or that's my uncle, or that's whatever. And I think part of what we need to start talking about is how do we hold those folks in community? How do we not necessarily send them to prison? How do we not like ex excommunicate them? But really what happens if those people are staying in our homes and staying in our communities? How can we have a conversation around justice and sexual assault around these things and yeah. hold them in community? Yeah. I think Susan had, uh, had expressed, um, maybe I'm, uh, I don't want to take it too far, but the sort of displacement of a lot of people uh, through the Me Too movement, that a lot of powerful men are being re replaced sometimes by women, and some women think that that's great, we'll finally get to these upper levels of power by moving out these uh, offending guys. Well, it is true that it is heartening to me to see when women replace men uh, at the top of various professions because men have misbehaved. I mean, I, I don't glory in anybody's suffering, I just mean that it's so hard for women to achieve those positions. And in many cases, corporations are now shamed into it um, when they didn't do it as they should have done before. But I, I would say that, to me, th th I do think that we're at this sort of cultural reckoning. And, and the reason this is so interesting is that it does really feel to me the way it felt in the 60s and the 70s. And I think that that's really interesting. You know, uh, and because I think it is much broader than what the law allows or doesn't allow, or how we. I think it's a question of a lot of women, um, probably, f you know, fewer women of color because they had been much more in tune with a certain degree of oppression and injustice. Um, you know, but I think that. There was a sense many laws were on the books. There was a, there had been a lot of progress on multiple levels, and then you begin thinking, "Wow, it turns out that sexual harassment, you know, has been more endemic than many people broadly understood, um, and it turns out that um, certain things that we thought were culturally, I'm not making a political statement here, but every political pundit thought." that what came out during the campaign um, from Access Hollywood was a kind of disqualification. And that turned out not to be true for lots of really interesting reasons. Um, and I'm just saying that I think, therefore, we're examining cultural assumptions in a way that I find really intriguing as a journalist. Well, I, I, if there was a cultural assumption back in the 60s and 70s, and maybe there was, um, that somehow all this legal equality that we were achieving during that period and in some of the years that follow would really drastically change social attitudes, would almost eliminate harassment, then that was incredibly naive of us. Um, because a lot of this, you know, people act badly. People will always act badly. I used to think that the 
the best way to deal with sexual harassment was to integrate more women into the workforce, to have situations where men and women were working in, collegially, and, and I think in a way that that did help. You know, I, I think we're hearing about a lot of harassment that we haven't heard about over the years, but we tend not to hear about all the situations in which men are being very helpful and very supportive to their female colleagues. I know I've experienced it. Um, much more accepting of women in positions in power than they were when I started out 30 or 40 so we'll, years we'll ago. So we'll agree that, that not and, every man. Well, it's, no, it's not that not, of course we're all gonna agree about that. But that, I think that bringing more women into the workforce has, you know, it's had the dual effect of giving more opportunities for harassment but also uh, socializing a lot of men who weren't as well socialized before. I mean, I can tell you from my own experience that the harassment that I experienced was not when I was in a formal workplace. It was as a freelancer. It was... As a freelancer. As a freelancer. Uh, let's move into uh, the, the area of, of what do we do? You know, we've got Time's Up. Uh, they have created a legal fund. Um, uh, as we understand it, they haven't been able to decide exactly what to do. Uh, they've got all of this activity, action, energy. Uh, people are upset. They're ready to do something, and the question is, what? I mean, the legal fund, as you know, I think Carol uh, talked about. You know, it, you're in big trouble if you win your legal case because you may not get your job back. You'll get fired. You'll get. So, what? What do you see as? the solution to all of this. Bianca, do you want to take a stab at this? I mean, I think part of it, um, Wendy just said, you know, you were talking about the increasing representation of women in these spaces. Um, and I, I believe that's a great thing. I also know that women also participate and help in patriarchy if they're not feminists, right? If they're not like really paying attention to the ways that they may um, help with some of the power differentials. So I think part of it is like getting women in the door, which is diversity and inclusion, and then getting them equity, giving them some power. So what happens, what happens at our institutions um, if we center women and allow them to actually make decisions and the transformations and changes that need to be made? Part of what happened is that those women got into the door and then no one listened to them or they were at the end of the table or, you know, they had to fight to be heard. What happens if we allow, the farm workers, who help Time's Up get created know what they need in the fields. They know what they need on their job, um, but they're fighting to be heard in many ways by all of us. So if we center the folks that are most marginalized, I believe that they have ideas about how to make institutions more um, equitable. So let's bring up the issue of white women versus black women politically in the last few cycles here. Um, in Alabama, most uh, white women voted for Roy Moore. Um, well, what, uh, I mean, most black, 98% of black women voted for Doug Jones. Uh, the same thing in the election. What, what, give me your take on why that's happening. Now, we know it's, some of it's identification with their husbands. These are a lot of married women who are voting with their husbands. Well, and some What's of it is the, Alabama politics. Um, I, I'm guessing, and I, I'm not familiar with Alabama politics, but I, I'm guessing that a lot of the white women who are voting for Roy Moore were also deeply religious conservative. Um, I, I think you'd really have to know what was going on in Alabama to be able to answer that question. I think well, wh white supremacy is a very yeah, seductive drug. And um, we have seen, if you take every movement. You said um, white supremacy is, is a, a seductive, seductive drug. drug. Um, and if you take every movement, uh, Leslie Mack, who's an uh, organizer in the Movement for Black Lives and also in the UU Church, has a hashtag that she created called Trust Black Women. Um, and part of what came out after the Roman War there were these articles around trusting black women, right? So 94% of black women voting this way, 98% of black women voting this way. Um, and if you actually trust black women and follow their uh, kind of political action and their suggestions for how to make things more equitable, a lot of change has happened if you look at every movement in the US. So part of what happens is, is white women, generally speaking, 53% for Trump, voted for white supremacy. That's what happened. And so in this conversation around Me Too, in this conversation around feminisms um, and, and sexual violence, we really need to interrogate, one, this category of, of women and who we mean by that, but also the different positionalities um, 
that's why I say center patriarchy, because if you center patriarchy, we have diff very different relationships to that, I as a black woman and some of the people in this room. Um, so I think there's, a, there's some contention, there's some, some tension, some issues that need to be talked out between black women and white women, and white women may need to just take a seat and listen and trust. Carol, you remember well, I'm sure, uh, the Anita Hill controversy. Anita Hill, Anita yes, Hill. of course. Yes. And uh, right around that time, shortly after that, I interviewed Eleanor Holmes Norton for a longer article about women in politics, and she talked a lot about how the uh, Hill-Thomas confrontation was, she talked a lot about the reaction as she saw it in the black community, and what I remember her saying to me was, race trumps sex. Race trumps race Trump sex. sex. Do you believe that? I don't know. You Carol? tell me. Huh? I, I, it's provocative. Yeah. Put it. I have to think about that. Huh? I don't know. It's very provocative. Yes, no. Bianca. For whom would be my question? <laughs> For whom? I think as a black woman, it's not many moments that I get to choose which one is important to me. When I am stopped by police, I have to worry about both white supremacy and being sexually assaulted. So I think certain people get to choose when they put race at the forefront because they are not necessarily in the same position as me in the system of racism and white supremacy and other people are allowed to put gender at the forefront. So I, my question would be for whom? Susan, you have one away. Um, you know, I, I think that it, there's no doubt that after the 2016 election, for example, there were a lot of really painful conversations and anger about that exit poll statistic. And, you know, um, I know I talk to a lot of political scientists who study patterns of voting. I'm not actually trying to excuse this. I'm just trying to say what political science, they used another formulation, party trumps gender. Um, I, I'm, uh, again, I'm not uh, attempting to, to um, whitewash, you know, the racial issues that were stirred by this. But that's also been an interesting pattern, is that um, I think that a lot of people believed in something that a kind of um, solidarity as women, that women have not always shown each other and that political patterns of voting suggest does not always hold. So that might be yet another thing for us to think about. Yeah, we have a, um, a question from the audience. Should we begin to educate a strong female self-esteem, allowing girls and women to report and not be quiet? Um, so in the, in the midst of all of these cases coming out, one after the other, day after day, you know, even I said, wait a minute, what's wrong with women? What's wrong with these girls? Why couldn't they say no? You know, it's an, it's an overreaction uh, but at some point, we have to admit that we, you know, fell, we have fallen down in tra on training our girls and making them strong enough to say, no, cut it out, don't touch me. I don't know that I would agree with that. I think, Bianca? I think, um, I think girls, the girls that I see and that I'm around are, have very strong voices, um, and whether or not they speak it or write it or perform it or um, you know, engage it in social media in some way, in some other creative way, are very vocal about the world that they experience and are very critical and have an analysis about it. It's whether or not we actually respect and listen to them is part of the problem. And I think when I hear this kind of, I wouldn't call it over-reporting, the, the, the thousands and millions of stories that are coming out in all these ways, I think, wow, patriarchy is really strong because it, it shut down all these stories that people have been telling you know, to their moms, to, to their grandmothers when they're getting their hair done, all these social spaces where people have passed down generational trauma and have spoken in their own different ways, their stories, but again, we have not provided a system or systems or different ways for them to get justice. And I think if we focus on the people that are actually doing it, if we figure out how to teach boys how to do better around these things, if we, if we teach boys that this behavior, this patriarchy is actually harmful to you, 
that this is part of the world that you should also be reimagining and re-envisioning, then we do the work. I, I'm not really for the more policing of the women and girls. I'm thinking the guys need to spend some more time every day engaging how they are perpetuating and really um, exercising their power and privilege whenever they may not even realize it. I'd like us to think about the ways in which our notions of trauma are culturally determined and culturally specific. Because I hear a lot of young women talking about being traumatized by behaviors that I, and, and I know a lot of women of my generation, just shrugged off. We now, were tough. And No, I'm not saying that we were tough. I'm not saying that we were right and that, they were, that they're wrong. I'm not, I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying that it's very interesting to me the way culture shapes our own perceptions of our own experiences and our own reactions to them. Um, take a look at Monica Lewinsky's very recent article in Monica, mm. in, in, in Monica Fair, in, in Vanity Fair. Yeah, it's me really, too. It's really right. fascinating because she says the Me Too movement has basically taught her that what she, until a few years ago, believed was a consensual relationship really was not because she was really not in a position where she could consent. And, what, and the reason I found that so interesting was that I thought it really exemplified the way we're shaped by culture, by a cultural moment. Because, you know, when Monica Lewinsky was 40 years old, she was saying, I was not abused by Bill Clinton. That was a consensual relationship. I was abused by the press. I was abused by the critics. I was certainly abused by the FBI. And remember, Monica Lewinsky had a lot of nerve, and I say that uh, you know, as a compliment. That, that girl, and she was 21 years old, she stood up to the FBI when they ambushed her in a hotel room. So you know, she, was, she had something, Monica Lewinsky. But it's, it's really interesting to see the way she is reinterpreting her own experience Understanding in the light of this movement. What had happened to her. A question from the uh, reinterpreting audience. Reinterpreting what had happened to her. Right. Uh, in an age of accepting gender fluidity, how do we justify prioritizing sexual harassment of women over that of men, gay or straight? I don't think we should prioritize it in individual cases, but I think if it's in a larger term, you know, if it's in larger terms, much more of a problem for many more women, in some ways, yes, it does get prioritized. Anybody else want to, Bianca, do you have a... I'm not sure I get the question completely. Um, can you read it one more time for me? So, uh, in an age of accepting gender fluidity, how do we justify prioritizing sexual harassment of women over that of men, whether they be gay or straight? Right, so I, I feel like I'm, I'm repeating myself, so forgive me, but I think um, some of this is about identity. Clearly, women as a community, and we can define that many ways, um, experience a certain, uh, um, are disproportionately experiencing sexual harassment and sexual violence. Um, I think men who are queer, and we have the stats that show that men who are queer, um, men who are, who are trans also experience this violence. But if you center patriarchy, you can deal with all of that. You can deal with the different ways that those folks with different identities experience the same force of oppression. Does that make sense? We can have, we, in a feminist project, we can have a conversation about how women are um, catcalled on the street, are being raped in disproportionate numbers, and at the same time have a conversation around how men are also experiencing that, but differently. Um, that's why it's a feminist project. It's difficult, it's hard, it's slow. Um, I think some of the frustration we're seeing in this moment is how to do that intersectional work simultaneously, right? Some of the tips that we see is my oppression is more than yours. Um, but if you censor the system of oppression, then we all get to work against that thing together. Carol, I um, uh, want to talk to you about legal issues. Uh, Catherine McKinnon has said uh, in a New York Times op-ed that the Me Too movement has done more uh, against sexual harassment than any of the laws that were written throughout the ages. 
Um, how do you feel about that? I think, I think there's a lot of validity, validity in that analysis. Uh, at the end of the day, it really put a really strong spotlight. Can you put your mic up a little yeah, bit? Yeah. It, it really, the Me Too movement put a strong spotlight on something that we all intuitively knew was happening, was not being covered either by the media or by institutions, and all the laws that were on the books were literally on the books, and that's where they stayed. Um, so I think it's really important that this conversation continues um, in a very in a very dramatic way. And I think the professor and I think um, Wendy also made, I think both of you made the same point that I just want to reiterate the role of integration in, in the workforce. Um, at the end of the day, we hold as women very few leadership positions in this country across the board. So whatever institution you work at, whether you work at a hospital or a police station or you're a judge in a courthouse, I can almost guarantee you that the person leading that institution is male. Um, I think the only institution that I can think of off the top of my head that that may not be the case in this region are the courts, right? The chief judge in the, in the federal court and in the state court are both women. But for the most part, the hospitals, the universities, right, the union leaders, they are men. And I think that we need to distribute power a little bit more equitably. And I think once we have decision makers, you know, equal means equal. It really does. And I think we will be able to really go a long way. Catherine McKinnon also says that she believes that the only thing that will change things is the, is the ERA, the Equal Rights Amendment. Constitutional um, equality is something that we're going to be working very hard on. Uh, Wendy, uh, we're, we're trying to amend, those of us in the ERA coalition are trying to amend the Constitution. Good luck with that. <laughs> well, we didn't make it the first time around, but no, how would you... <laughs> deja vu all over again. Deja vu. How would... We were, we were close. We were close. But how, but how, how would you feel about the, the, the new amendment that we're working on, which includes people of color and gender expression and disability and faith? I haven't seen the language. Okay. See there, there's a lawyer, another lawyer. <laughs> <from> the, <laughs> she wants to see the specific, oh, who are also left out of the Constitution. Yeah, everybody is, including my uh, journalist sitting next to me here who is not, not engaging. So I, <laughs> I can't, some limits oh, on my like, speech. I do remember those days, right, when I, um, so should we begin to educate a strong, I think we've talked about this, a strong female self-esteem. Yes. Uh, and uh, I just read recently an article by a young black woman uh, in college uh, who talked about being 12 years old and being in an elevator on a class trip when one of the uh, leaders standing behind her touched her body and she didn't say anything. And what she was saying in this article was that as a black, brown girl, she knew then that her body did not belong to her and that she needed to keep the peace and not upset this guy who was fondling her. Any comments about that kind? I know we've been over this territory some, but I'm looking for the future in terms of how we get, get I there. I think we are... Um Part of what you're seeing in this moment around trying to find language to, to kind of give voice to everything people are experiencing is um, I think in some ways we're underestimating the very deep emotional trauma that individuals have experienced, but also as a collective, like the past year and a half has been an everyday exercise in trying to like engage wellness, um, emotional wellness, physical wellness and just self-care. Um, and part of what I am excited about in this moment, but also very wary of, is a national conversation around emotional wellness and self-care that I, I see people engaging. Like, how are you taking care of yourself? How do you survive and thrive after an experience like that? Um, and I don't think we have the tools yet. I think people are kind of struggling to figure out how to have these conversations and then be well after that. Part of what you're seeing is men 
not only women suddenly realizing, oh, I've experienced some form of sexual violence, but men saying, oh my gosh, I've done this thing. And I don't really know if I can say to anyone and confess to anyone that I have done this thing because now this means I'm a terrible person. Um, and so par we really need to kind of figure out, oh, I don't know where the place is. It, to me, it's not the courtroom or it's not you know, legislation. I don't know where we go to begin to have collective and communal conversations around the harm that people on all sides are experiencing. Um, and uh, I was gonna say, you know, there's been a question about why are we seeing so few women of color come public with their stories? And it was really interesting to me that Harvey Weinstein, the only accuser that he has um, directly addressed and said she was lying was Lupita Nyong'o. And I don't think that's by coincidence that that's the only person that he has called out for lying. And so there's been this ask about why women of color have not been coming forward. And, I, and uh, a brother that I know asked me that and I said, because we love you too much. And it was my visceral response was that, again, this question of race and gender, right? Like we are having a hard time trying to figure out how to be well and take care of ourselves with one another and not throw you over to police. Um, and so that 12 year old, and I see it all the time in college campuses, you know, my, my women of color graduate students and undergrads who come to me and they are telling me about the man of color in the department who they respected as a mentor, who was the only person of color in the department and so I trusted him and he did this violence to me, what do I do? And so I think, you know, the men in that situation are ever growing in their knowledge that they are doing, engaging in behavior that is not only disruptive, but problematic and oppressive. And we need to figure out ways to, again, hold people in community so we can have those conversations. Esther Armour calls it emotional justice, right. which and I I'm, think is I, a great idea. Yeah, I'm told that we only have a few minutes left in the, in the program. So if, if you want to address that issue or uh, come to your closing comments, uh, we can do that. Carol, can we start with you? Uh, certainly, I'm just going to uh, add a point to your to your question and just focus back on the point that you made about a 12 year old girl who who didn't report and who didn't tell anybody. And the fact of the matter is, um, and and the professor just said, like, off the top of your head, where would you refer? Can you move her your mic up? If okay. she needed, right. if she needed an IEP, if she was an alcoholic, if she was addict, if she had a pot problem, hundreds of resources would have known where to refer her to. That is not readily available. That is not part of the conversation. We know for a fact that girls who experience violence in their lives, the first time statistically starts at 12 and 13. So it's very interesting that you would cite that. So that is what we need to be committed to do now. Now wait to this new legislation, now and today. What do we do when that 12 year old comes to you or to you or to you that we have an answer ready and help. Wendy? I don't think, I don't imagine that what that girl was feeling was necessarily racially specific. The feeling, uh, maybe there's some racial elements to it in terms of what happens in the criminal justice system to black men, but the feeling that your body is not your own. Um, there's also just, I think, a feeling that your body will always be a source of danger to you. And I think that's something that we all internalize. And I think you can, I, I think you can internalize that without being traumatized by it. I'm not saying that that's a good thing, but you know, it's, it's hard for me to think of a way out of that without thinking that you can actually reform human nature. Wow, human nature. Well, I guess that's what m many of us want to do, reform, reform human nature. Susan? Well, I, I, I feel that what's really important is that, at least my hope, is that the conversation that has kind of erupted about Me Too extends beyond the sphere of sexual harassment into questioning um, the role of women and men in our broader society. I'm, I'm, I'm interested 
in whether this country is kind of ready for that kind of questioning as it was back in the 60s and 70s. And I'm not actually saying that I am talking about some kind of replica, but I, I think that the courage of women who came forward and the fact that you know Anita Hill was not believed um, and all these years later we're, we're, we're seeing repercussions that, and consequences that we didn't see then, I'm hoping that we see more questioning. I mean, I think the point, I think it was, I'm so sorry, I think it was Carol or Bianca, I'm, I can't recall which, but the point about look up and see who's running, I think it's Carol, running everything, men are still running everything. And everything. So, and so, I, you know, I think that's a really important thing to think about. Bianca? So I think part of what's happening right here is, Bianca. again, an exercise yes. in patriarchy. Yeah. And the way that people, who feels entitled to speak, who feels entitled to tell their story, when we listen to them, and at what point in our world do women hold the mic and need the mic to speak over the voices that feel entitled to speak? This is part of what you're seeing in this moment. Hey, well, thank you so much. We, we have at least another hour or two that we could talk, but uh, Susan Shear, Wendy Kavanagh, Bianca Williams, and Carol Robles-Roman, thank you all so much for the conversation.